And what did Quasi Quateng say the other day? OK, my budget wasn't perfect. <laughs> Master of understatement, I think. <laughs> Mr Speaker, the response from Number 10 yesterday seemed to be that their whole argument is we did it because you guys did it. But, Mr Speaker, I'm old enough to remember a fresh-faced Prime Minister coming into Downing Street promising change. Justifying their action based on things that we've done doesn't really seem like the change that we were promised, now does it? Mr Speaker, we are learning the lessons of why we lost to the election, but this Government seems to be taking lessons from the worst bits of our record. And not just ours, the last Labour Government too. It's like the greatest hits of government mistakes being replayed in just 100 days. Cronyism? Is it Blair? No. It's the fresh-faced Labour government giving civil service jobs to donors. A gross betrayal of pensioners. Is it Brown? No. It's the new Chancellor deciding that those on £13,000 are rich and don't need their winter fuel payments. Rampant politicisation of our institutions. Was this something they accused Boris Johnson of? Mr Speaker, no. It's the Chancellor again saying this weekend that the ex-Prime Minister and Chancellor will have to answer to the OBR, despite the OBR saying that the report has nothing to do with previous Ministers and led Times to argue that the OBR has been reduced to, and I quote, the provisional wing of the Treasury Press Office. Disrespectful statements emanating from Number 10 about your decisions, Mr Speaker. Not us, but the Number 10 Press Office just yesterday and potentially breaching the ministerial code with abandon about budget leaks. Right again, it's this government. Their false piety has been breached so comprehensively by the Downing Street parcel scandal and crony appointments to the civil service. Their hypocrisy has been laid bare for all to see. Yet still, they bleat on about the Tories like some broken spell. They try to mutter over and over again in an attempt to conjure up the old magic. But it's not going to work. Yeah. Labour are so obsessed with playing political games that they find themselves, Mr Speaker, going into the budget simultaneously claiming that the Conservatives spent too much, but they also spent too little. It's nonsense. So, Mr Speaker, the question that I want to ask the opposition today is who is going to take responsibility for the budget leaks and what assessment have they made of whether this is a breach of the ministerial code? Yeah. Minister. Mr Speaker, as I've said, I have deep respect for this House and its members, and the coming days will be very important to debate the Budget in full. But I'm sure Honourable and Right Honourable Members will forgive me if I have a degree of cynicism about the party opposite's yeah. newfound passion for parliamentary conventions, given the number of times they failed in their 14 years in office to update the House ahead of major announcements. But the truth is, Mr Speaker, that the Conservative Party are desperate to speak about nothing other than the appalling mess they left our national finances in. And, Mr Speaker, there are many groups of people I would listen to on budget management, but certainly not the party that crashed the economy. And you'd think they'd have learned some lessons from attacking independent financial institutions, but they haven't. The shadow chance and the Chief Secretary attacking the Office for Budget Responsibility once again. And, Mr Speaker, Families in my constituency and across the country are still paying higher rents and mortgage costs because of the mini-budget two years ago that created and wreaked such havoc on our economy. And unlike the party opposite, this government will never pay, play fast and loose with the nation's finances. Tomorrow we will see a budget focused on investment to get the economy moving again. This Government will take the long-term decisions needed to rebuild Britain, fix our schools, our hospitals and our broken roads. The Conservatives, Mr Speaker, have not changed. All they offer is decline and more austerity, with working people paying the price. James Britt. Speaker, in very north, rents and mortgages are still sky high as a direct line, direct consequence of the economic legacy of the last Conservative Government. It's no surprise to me that they want to talk about anything other than their economic record. Does the Minister agree? Mr Speaker, I certainly do agree, but it was, and I'm sure it will come as a surprise to honourable and right honourable members, that one of their former chancellors did decide to comment on the 2022 fiasco that yeah. September. And what did Kwasi Kwarteng say the other day? OK, my budget wasn't perfect. Oh. <laughs> Master of understatement, I think. 
My constituents in North East Derbyshire are still paying the price with the rises to their mortgages and rents caused by the mini budget. Does the Minister agree with me that the Conservatives should be talking about this and holding themselves to account rather than just throwing out chaff to distract everyone? My honourable friend is absolutely right. And in the Shadow Chief Secretary's contribution, there was one word that was noticeably missing. Sorry. One of the remits of the new modernisation committee is to enhance the ability of members of this House to hold the government to account. So, in light of the failure that's been exhibited over recent days, would the Minister be in favour of referring this issue to the Modernisation Committee? Well, um, I, I wasn't aware, Mr Speaker, that the financial mismanagement of the party opposite was a matter for the Modernisation Committee, <laughs> but, sh- but certainly it should be referred to something. We hear a lot about 14 years of failure, but it seems to me this government has had 14 years to learn how the ministerial code works. And the reality is that the announcement made by the Chancellor last week, it moved the markets. Bond yields went up, which means mortgages went up, which means that people's bills have gone up. I think the right thing for the government to do, Mr Speaker, is to apologise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I would say to the uh, honourable gentleman, first of all, in terms of the impact of what the Chancellor announces, we will see that tomorrow and in the days afterwards. But we will see the ministerial code published shortly, and it is in stark contrast to what the previous government did. I, I, on those opposition benches, watch them try and tear up the entire rule book to try and protect one of their friends, something we will not do. Now, over the last few days, we've had multiple leaked definitions of what working people are. So could I ask the minister if they place in the House of Commons library a definition ready for tomorrow's budget so we can all understand who they're talking about? I mean, exactly about working people, Mr Speaker. Working people are the people who have been so appallingly let down by the party opposite. They are the people who are paying extra costs in their mortgages and their rents every month. They are the people hit by the cost of living. They are the people left on record waiting lists by the party opposite. And they are the people this government is determined to deliver for. We now come to Paul Holmes. <laughs> and there was I ready to defend your honour, sir, because even after your speaker's ruling yesterday, sir, the government made more announcements on the BBC this morning concerning health services. So can I ask the Paymaster General whether he has asked the advice of his advisers at the Cabinet Office to do with the Ministerial Code, whether he thinks that the Chancellor or any other Minister has broken the Ministerial Code, and if he hasn't asked for that advice, why hasn't he? Mm. Oh, Mr. Speaker, I mean, come on, the, the party opposite, which showed zero respect for the ministerial code in office, coming trying to put questions like that. It really is appalling. It is double standards. Expect <coughs> better, better from a senior whip. Right, that complete.